this is Dr. Rachel Tapman for Cohere, and today I want to talk about some tips and tricks for helping to use large language models to build chatbots a little bit faster. And the first thing that I want to bring up is that I would strongly advise against serving raw generated text to users for both UX and security reasons, right? It's going to be unpredictable. <laughs> um, and also large language model output by default is not grounded, is not tied to any information. So if, for example, you have a commerce chatbot uh, and someone attempts to order something, you may get um, a chatbot a large language model producing uh, output like order placed successfully, even when that order was not successfully placed. So I just recommend it for that reason. Uh, and also for security reasons, um, a lot of the adversarial attacks against large language model based systems require access to raw text output. So if you don't have that, you just won't have to deal with the adversarial attacks. So given that I wouldn't recommend that, what would I recommend in order to increase the pace of chatbot development? So my general recommendation is human in the loop data augmentation, um, which means using the uh, large language model to generate additional data that is human validated, uh, that allows you to get a little bit of a warmer start when you are training or fine tuning a chatbot. So when is it especially helpful to do data augmentation? Well, first of all, you may not have representative data for all of your targeted user personas. So you may be building a chatbot, for example, this commerce chatbot, uh, and you may be uh, targeting a couple of different personas, maybe someone who's doing their weekly grocery shopping, uh, and perhaps someone else who is shopping for a party, and you want to make sure that uh, both those uh, users get their needs met. And if you don't have representative data for both of those people, um, a language, large language model can help you to, to flesh out your, your initial training data. Um, you can also use it to generate examples for new specific intents. Um, for example, if you have a new topic that suddenly becomes relevant and you need to add it to your chatbot, uh, you can use um, you know, large language model generated data to help you get going a little bit faster there, uh, especially if you can't find existing data for it. Uh, and finally, if you have data, but it is too clean or it's not representative of user generated text. So uh, most research data sets, for example, tend to be uh, very clean, right? They tend to be, you know, have consistent capitalization and punctuation. They tend not to have a lot of spelling errors. Um, so being able to generate text data that is a little bit noisier can be very helpful if that's what your system is going to see in production. So uh, if you know that you need to do data augmentation, uh, why would you use large language models over you know, templatic data augmentation or perhaps a strategy like translating to and from another language? So one of the biggest benefits is you can avoid the repetition in uh, template based uh, data augmentation. Um, so template based data augmentation usually has, for example, more or less the same syntactic structure. Um, and you can sometimes get uh, sort of weird, um, depending on how you're doing that augmentation, weird edge errors where a human probably wouldn't say that. So in an idiom like turning the page, turn is often used as a synonym for rotate. Uh, but of course, they are uh, not, <laughs> they're not replaceable here. Rotating the page means something different from turning the page. Um, it can also, if your other option was to generate all new data, um, which, you know, always an option, um, generally going to be a little bit slower and a little bit more expensive and perhaps a little bit uh, less easy to tune. Uh, and a final reason why uh, it makes particular use to use a large language model is because if you are going to be encountering noisy user generated text, well, large language models are trained uh, in no small part on noisy user generated text. So uh, for example, uh, the, the Cohere large language models, this here is from the documentation, um, is trained on, among other things, a common crawl, which includes a lot of social media data. Um, and uh, we have some links here to some of the different sites that are um, highly included, and they include things like Tumblr uh, and Stack Exchange, uh, Medium, which has comments as well. Uh, so you have existing examples of noisy user generated text in the training data, which means that the model is more likely to be able to successfully generate examples of that for your work. So that's why you would do it, uh, how to do it. Uh, and of course, depending on your specific case, you may have a lot of variation in what you actually choose to do, but here are some recommendations. 
Um, so uh, I would recommend working with what existing data you do have and using that to prime the model doing prompt engineering to generate new data. Uh, so we have uh, an example that we're going to be working through here. I've taken some intents from the Slurp data set, uh, which was developed by uh, Bastianelli et al. 2020, which is uh, freely available. Uh, and the prompts here were generated by mechanical work, uh, mechanical Turk workers, and the transcribed data is very clean and fairly formal. So here are some examples for the intent play music. The intent labels here are generated by me. Um, so some example utterances would be play my favorite playlist, play Irene by Toby Mac, start my jazz playlist, shuffle and play the playlist. So if this was our existing data and we wanted to get more training examples for our chatbot, how could we do this? So one way to do it would be to prompt using this existing data uh, and also including a little bit of formatting in your prompt. So for example, here I'm going to use this heading intent colon name of the intent. Uh, I'm also going to include a markdown list format with dashes at the beginning of each line. Uh, and then I will include at the end a dash that is empty after it to uh, prompt the model to continue working on the list. So uh, just an example of what that looks like. This is from the Cohere Playground. Uh, you can see here, using this paradigm, uh, I got a bunch of additional examples um, that more or less were usable. So uh, of these examples, uh, one the only one that was generated that I would say definitely doesn't belong in this intent is set up the alarm. Setting an alarm is a different task from playing music. Um, whereas other examples like start shuffle my music, resume playing, playing this album, plays jazz in the kitchen, uh, I would say are all you know perfectly acceptable. Uh, and the last item looks like it was maybe cut off. Uh, resume the song that I was, which I would say is not a good training example, but is more or less in this intent. So about 75% of these examples uh, I would be willing to include in the training data for this. Just to do uh, another example, so this is a separate intent. Uh, all these examples here are human generated. Uh, and the intent here is set an alarm or reminder. Um, so put an alarm on my calendar every week. I need a 6 a.m. wake up call. And using the same prompting um, paradigm, we got about 80% of the generated examples were usable. Um, so the one that is a little bit questionable is ring an alarm to notify me when something will happen. Um, I when something will happen is not uh, <laughs> not particularly tractable as a, uh, a target time to set an alarm. But the rest of them, I would say, are pretty good training examples, right? So example, add a reminder to my calendar every Monday to read news. So these were all uh, ways of increasing the volume of data you had in a way that was very similar to the existing data. What if you wanted to add some data diversity? Um, so uh, some techniques for prompting that I think would be a little bit more risky would be to prompt based on emotion uh, or prompt based on uh, a stated specific user persona. Um, and something that I think is a little bit less risky but is going to require more domain knowledge is uh, prompting by referencing specific websites. So uh, prompting based on emotion um, has a couple different problems. So here I have an example of uh, someone angrily asking a chatbot to play music. Uh, and the first example, I want to listen to music now, capitalized, I'd say fits the prompt. Uh, but as uh, we go down through the existing prompts, uh, through the generated data, you can see that the, uh, the intent times to actually switch. So some of the generated examples are stop playing music, stop playing that music, music off, which is the opposite of the intent that you are intending. Uh, and part of the issue here is that emotional context and intent are not IID, right? It, uh, are not independently <laughs> distributed. So if you are have an intent for booking a flight, uh, you are probably going to have more neutral sort of emotions associated with that. Uh, if you are talking to customer service after your flight has been canceled and trying to rebook, you're much more likely to get negative emotions with that. So attempting to prompt for intent uh, to generate data for intents based on emotional content is likely to often lead to difficulties and generated text that doesn't fit in your intended intent. It may be situationally useful if you're trying to create data for an intent that is often associated with a strong emotion, especially a strong negative emotion. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, you might think to try user-based prompts, right? So here we have um, examples of a 20-year-old student asking a chatbot to stay mute, to play music. Um, and you can see that the uh, examples are fairly generic or fairly similar to the, um, the prompt that was not uh, primed with a specific user persona. Um, but uh, one thing that I would play out, point out here is one of these examples is play the latest hits. Um, I don't know that I've ever heard a 20 year old student say anything uh, like that. But what I have heard is uh, people who are not in that group stereotyping that group by their love of the latest hits. So the issue here is that if you are specifying the type of user that you want, stereotyping is very likely. Uh, and this is due uh, in part to the underlying distribution. Generally, people don't introduce themselves by their demographic qualities in an online forum. Um, if I am doing that, usually I'm doing it to stereotype or joke about those people, right? Uh, so an example of this would be like, um, if I were uh, joking about people from Ohio, I might say, oh, look at me, I'm from Ohio. I love the Ohio State. Um, when that is not, I would say, an especially fair characterization of all people from Ohio. Um, and I would say one possible exception here would be to try and get multilingual data. Uh, so here we have an example of attempting to get similar um, data, except it is in French. Um, and I would say the success rate is okay. Uh, one of the generated um, uh, one of the generated items uh, means something completely different. So check the checkbox uh, instead of play music. Um, and one of the items is in the same general topic. So this this top one, I believe a, a balladeur is a Walkman, which uh, again, probably not something a lot of people are talking about uh, when prompting a voice assistant. Um, so potentially useful, but proceed with caution. What I think is probably going to be more generally useful for most folks is to use social media sites as proxies for personas and um, domains that they are interested in. So uh, just in this example, uh, there is Reddit data in this data set, uh, and Reddit tends to have a very strong skew towards male users. So it has about twice as many uh, male as female users. Um, or if you really wanted, uh, you know, to focus on younger users, the majority of Snapchat users are under 29. Um, so obviously different social media sites also have an effect of topic. So very specialized platforms are more likely to have very specific types of language used on them. So Nextdoor is used for talking about local matters, Stack Overflow used for um, talking about, you know, technology <laughs> and programming. Uh, Ravelry is a uh, fiber arts based social networking site. Again, very narrow domain. Um, the benefit of using this is that A, we have pretty good information about the sorts of people who use different social media sites. It may even be part of the personas that your conversational design team has come up with. Um, and we're very likely to see examples from users on those sites in the data. So let's look at a couple examples here. Uh, so here we have uh, some examples of someone on Stack Overflow asking a chat bot to start playing music. I would say these are not great examples of the intents, but it's a good uh, demonstration of the effect of prompting based on a specific site. So my bot does not play music. Any suggestion? How to play audio on another program? Any way to play YouTube music on Google Home? So these are questions you might see on Stack Overflow. And some demographic things to consider, uh, slight gender bias, a little bit more likely to be male, generally working age, not a lot of children, not a lot of uh, very old people, uh, tends to be in more of a professional context and is of course for a specific domain. Um, some other uh, examples here. So here we have Facebook. Um, some examples of the output here are, I need a mood lifter. Can you play something upbeat? What's playing? Question mark. What music are you playing? Question mark. So um, some qualities of Facebook, it tends to be fairly gender balanced, uh, but it does skew older. Um, I believe of all of the major social media sites, Facebook has the oldest user base. Um, you'll have a variety of contexts. There's going to be a big focus on news and current events, and it's very broad domain. Um, and something I would point out in this data in particular is that the uh, capitalization and punctuation here are even more formal. Um, so following patterns generally associated with, with older language users. 
Um, on the other hand, something like YouTube is going to skew quite a bit younger. Uh, so here, uh, some of the generated uh, examples here are, uh, how can I listen to your music? I need to listen to some music. Uh, what song should I listen to? So some general notes about using this uh, type of approach to generate text data. The more unique and specific your intents are, uh, the less well this will work. Uh, and that's because there's just less likely to be a lot of examples that are relevant in the training data. Um, so you are more likely to get unhelpful approaches you are more likely to get unhelpful data. So something like asking whether or not this is a chatbot that the user is talking to, you're probably likely to get pretty good results. Um, something like asking for the specific version number of the chatbot, you are you know, perhaps not as likely to get as good results. Uh, and the more you are trying to capture usage patterns that are well represented in the training data set, so online, <laughs> the more likely you are to be successful. Uh, and just a final reminder that adding data diversity in this way is really a stopgap measure. It's a way to give you a warmer start to get you going. Uh, it's not actually representative of your users. So your best bet is going to be, once you have a system that works pretty well, uh, start folding in actual user data because that's always going to be the most relevant. So if you've generated some data and you would like to do uh, validation to make sure that you're not putting something in your system that will make it perform worse, my general recommendation is to do hand validation, uh, look at the data that you are looking at. You may even use um, you know, an annotation tool like Prodigy to do a quick up down vote about whether or not this particular uh, input fits the intended intent. Um, and if you would like to do a little bit more validation, you could use an embedding visualizer like the one provided by Cohere to make sure uh, both that within you know, different clusters, you're having a mix of real and generated data. Uh, ideally, you don't want to generate very tight clusters of data that may skew your model output or you know, skew your uh, uh, a model's ability to handle the wide diversity of ways that people express themselves when talking to chatbots. Uh, and also, if new clusters are introduced, you want to make sure that you are happy with those results. Uh, so here I have an example. Uh, we have a little bit of a cluster down here at the bottom. Again, this is from the Cohere Playground. We have a point here, I need a mood lifter. Can you play something upbeat? Uh, which, if you will remember, is from the YouTube generated data. Uh, however, this data point quite near it says, would you play some music, please? And this is from the human generated data from the Slurp data set. And the other cluster in the upper right hand corner uh, is similarly a mix of human and generated data, which is good. That's what you want to see. Uh, it means that you are not uh, you're filling in the embedding space. Um, you are not uh, creating new distinct clusters that have no overlap with your existing human data. Uh, so mix of original and generated data in this part of the visualization, probably these points are fine to keep. Uh, however, we have another cluster over here with two data points. One says, what's playing? Uh, and the other says, what music are you playing? Uh, and these are both generated data points. And I would say that they also have a mismatch with the intended intent of playing music. So this is more about asking for the track name. So these I would either want to remove entirely or relabel as a different intent. And if you kept them in, they may make it harder for your model to correctly classify whether someone is asking to start playing music or asking about what is currently playing, and you would expect different behaviors for those intents. So as a general review, large language models can help you with data augmentation, both adding volume and a little bit of diversity until you get real data. Uh, they can give you that warm start to get your system a little bit more usable. Um, you want to prompt with as much as possible existing data or newly written data, right? Use the, the human generated examples to, to anchor and validate your, um, your generated examples, uh, and then hand verify output uh, just to make sure it is uh, according to the standards of quality that you have for the project. All right, so I hope this is helpful. And if you are working on building chatbots and using large language models, uh, I hope that this helps you get started a little bit quicker uh, and gives you some good ideas for prompting and ways to do um, your work a little bit faster and easier.